is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, Season 2, Episode 7, E.B. Was Left Out. In this episode, I am low-key in love with Charlie Utter and want to marry him, and... No, that's about it. That's pretty much my takeaway from this episode. Charlie Utter for president. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many, many thanks to Patrick for commissioning this episode. Um, Patrick sent me an email and told me that he has strategically sped up the commissions on Deadwood so that I will be able to finish the series before the movie comes out so that he can then commission the movie. So I am super, super excited. Thank you, Patrick, for that. And uh, those of you who were, you know, wondering... What was going to go on with that? That is your uh, that is your answer. And there's also going to just be more Deadwood episodes coming out. There's normally about two a week, and it looks like he's doing like three a week um, for a little span there in order to get it done in time. So, yeah, this episode, y'all, I have, you know, um, I have to admit that when it came to the concept of Mr. Woolcut getting any sort of comeuppance for what he did. I had absolutely no expectation of that whatsoever. And I mean, that's pretty much just from living in the world. Like, as a woman, we know all too well that assertions of violence or any sort of movement against us, abuse of any kind, are not often taken very seriously. And there is usually a kind of assumption that we are exaggerating or oversensitive or something. And the number of women, especially sex workers, who are killed and seem to be like worth they they deserved it according to a lot of people because of what they do is still to this day as high as ever people do not value the lives of women in general a lot of the time unless they are associated with a man that they admire and they especially do not care about women who are sex workers and This camp, it's not like any of these sex workers, like that people even know their names unless they are somebody that is a regular or somebody who owns them. And the fact that we are so conditioned to not expect anything to happen to somebody who murdered three women, like I, it's, it's just, I just didn't expect it and it turns out that Bullock seems to be like pretty aware of what happened and he even like kind of clamps down on his own reaction to it because he recognizes as uh as Al says later that it's not for the good of the camp I mean on the one hand yes that is the smart thing to do and I appreciate that He is, as Al puts it, maturing and putting the needs of the camp and the needs of, like, dealing with the situation that we actually have versus the one that you wish we have, um, making that the priority. I respect that, but it's awfully hard for me to, like, watch Seth basically turn a blind eye to this and not judge that pretty harshly. I guess he is assuming at this point that Charlie Utter has it pretty much in hand and that he can like let Charlie deal with this if he wants to again. But I really judged him a little bit for that. And uh, 
you know, it's just, I, I, and I'm not trying to even say that Seth is dealing with these women in a different way than he would with other people because, you know, we saw a guy get like, you know, a couple episodes ago, he walked into a bar wearing somebody else's coat and got shot. And Seth basically told the guy who killed him to watch it. And then he just left. And that was the extent of the, quote, punishment meted out to this guy. So in that respect, this is somewhat par for the course. You can kill somebody in this camp and it doesn't make much of a blip, you know, Um but this is a particular, particularly heinous thing. Three women, you know, cold blood. It's just, it's really rough for me to, to see how little this matters. And not only just how little it matters, period, uh, but how few people even know about it. And that is something that, like, I do find believable. Like, I could see especially somebody with the power that Sai has being able to keep this quiet. But the fact that this like Shea me basically closed overnight and nobody even has been gossiping about it or wondering about it is I'm not really sure what that says about the camp or does it just say something about how the Shea me was not that popular? Maybe, you know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's the whole thing just is – my expectations were just really, really low, y'all. They just were. And they just are a lot of the time. Um, and then then we have the way that Charlie handles everything. I'm going to back up and start from the beginning of this episode because it's actually pretty near to the beginning that we get our – that scene – um, but I'll start things off with the um, scene between Al and Merrick, because I had said, you know, last episode that I wondered if Al was going to take up for Merrick, maybe try and get him on his own side or do something to otherwise sort of undermine Cy Tolliver. And first of all, we get this revelation that there's like a walkway that connects Merrick's place to... Uh, Al's place, which we did not know. And apparently Al did not know either. So in that sense, I am hopeful that just that literal physical connection between the two properties is going to wind up being something that's like meaningful later. I just really want Al to look out for Merrick. Uh, Merrick himself, meanwhile, is, you know, this is here's the thing, guys. I'm not trying to talk shit about Merrick in the way that you would where you're like, well, I wouldn't handle it this way. I'm trying to talk shit about Merrick in that Merrick needs to know where he lives and the standards of the people around him in the camp. And he needs to understand that he is not – he does not have the luxury of self-pity. In Like, there is just a different standard where he is. And this is something that's tr – like, I think a lot of us have been in different situations where we are very aware we can't handle things the way we normally would because of who we are surrounded by. Um, I have – like, this has happened when I have been abroad and kind of by myself um, go or, you know, going through some kind of training that's really physically demanding and my normal – instinct is to take a break, get some Advil and, you know, sort of like rest and recuperate for a minute. And I am surrounded by other people who are working as hard, if not harder than me, powering through it and saying nothing. And I know I am not going to be looked upon with any sort of favor by the people in charge if I do what I have my normal impulse to do. So I shut the fuck up and I get on with it. And this is what I need Merrick to do here. Merrick does not have any sort of context. It's which is a surprising thing because Merrick is a an intelligent guy with a deep awareness of the people around him because of what he does for a living. So you would think that he of all people would be a little bit more sensitive actually to the context and to making an a good impression of like his situation and that he is not going to be put down so easily. 
but he just is more concerned with the insult of the thing and talks about like the psychic wound and how that's going to be much more difficult to heal. And thankfully, Al slaps him in the face. I really needed this. Thank you, Al, for doing this, because this guy clearly thinks that Al is here to sort of commiserate or at least express sympathy in this way that's very indulgent. And that is just, you know, the way he said, I'm in despair. He wants Al to basically express condolences over the loss and like uh, probably a disapproval of what it was that Cy did. And Merrick, you need to know Al better than that. That is so not his style. Um, Not only is it not his style to like come right out and say that he's like versus Cy. Everyone knows it, but he rarely actually says it. But also he needs you to get back on your fucking feet. Like your business is important to his business and he isn't going to be here like having any sort of, of patience for you sitting and not carrying out what needs done, you know? And, uh, I really appreciated that he said, you know, You've been slapped a couple times. You have gotten your place bashed up, but the world isn't over and the world isn't over until we are dead. And it's going to keep on dealing out punishment until we are. And it's your job to stand it like a man and to deal some out, to deal out some back. And says so with a pretty significant look at Merrick before leaving. We do not get, before the end of this episode, any clue as to what that looks like, but it really feels like he's suggesting Merrick print something. And I just don't know what that would be, because Merrick is naturally going to be really afraid of, of incurring size wrath again. So it would have to be something that's somewhat subtle that he could even have plausible deniability about the damage that it is, it has wreaked. And I don't know what that looks like because I'm not sure to be honest. And I, I figure by now it's pretty clear to him, but I'm not entirely sure how much Merrick understands about what's been going on with the camp and them trying to like mess with the prices of, of claims and all of that. I figure that he's got it figured out at this point, but because of like, that's really the main thing. How good of a grasp he's got on that, I think will determine the way he decides to punish Psy. And I, for one, look forward to it. I don't want anything to happen to Merrick, but he is so like, he is so good with words and he is so like, I'm just hoping that he'll be able to figure something out that would still, like I said, give him plausible deniability or something to shield himself with. If anything, he could even say that somebody else asked him to publish something. Um, I don't know who he would say, but, you know, it could be uh, any like any person that (laughs) I'm just trying to think. Could you like make up a person in a camp like this and just say like, oh, yeah, old John Smith told me to publish this. Oh, nobody can find John Smith. I, I, I don't know where he went, but I promise you he came in and he gave me money and he told me to print this. Could he do that? Um, but anyway, I wanted to get Merrick out of the way because that was on my mind from the last episode. I'm a little bummed that this is all we get because I do want to know what he's going to do to handle this. But let me jump to the scene where Sai is talking to Lee, which is the name of the tall Asian man from San Francisco who, uh, is running the whores that are in cages. And Sai asks him, how do you get rid of bodies? Do you use pigs also? And Lee just stares at him and doesn't say anything. And Sai seems sort of amused by that and just says, yeah, I wouldn't tell either. Like that's, you know, that's a trade secret, basically. Um, then we see Joni and she has come back in and is giving back the money to the bartender, Joe, I think his name is. Um, Jack. Jack is his name. Jack, uh, is getting his loan back plus some extra and 
she goes in to see Sai. Um, as she goes in, it should be noted, Lee comes out and tips his hat to Joni, who nods to him. And as he walks past, as Lee walks past um, Stapleton and Leon, the two of them act completely disgusted with the fact that he tipped his hat, quote, like one human being to another. Honestly, you guys, how? How are were people like this? It's so gross to me. And I know they were. I know they were. This is no exaggeration. Are we just that desperate to feel superior to anybody else that we will pretend that somebody isn't even a person? Like, I just, wow. And and Leon, of all people, the scumbag, you know, like having the nerve to act like this person is below him. You are just as low as he, Leon. You both are terrible. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to stick up for fucking Lee either because he is scum. But yeah, so that moment just really like kind of creeped me out, especially it turns out later on that there's this whole thing going on with them sort of like low key being in charge of marketing, uh, quote unquote, for the the Asian whores. And Sai has to sort of like give them a spin on it and ba- it's it's an exotification um, is going to be the way that he handles because men don't want according to like the uh, the needs of this what's the word I want this market this demographic these guys are not really into fucking any women but white women. So they need to come up with an angle to make these women appealing beside them just being less expensive because it turns out that they really genuinely do not see Asians as people. And so on some level, there's like a shame at sleeping with these women because they are not people, which like... I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around this again. But so what Sai tells them to do is to go after the exotic angle and act as if these women have like completely different anatomy than a white woman. And that is something that persists to this day, I may add. Um, And they find out that Lee has sort of like taken over and is getting a line out the door And the two of them are, like, really angry at the fact that he is so much better at them than this. And Stapleton says something about how he's just better suited to the task in every way, speaks both languages fluently, and is willing to stand in filth. And there's, like, it's a combo of compliments and sort of an insult. But I do think there is a root there of feeling like, I thought I was superior to this guy and he's better at this basic shit than I am. And is that going to be a cause for even more resentment or is that going to motivate them to fucking do better? Because it's not like they're actually making an effort, you know? Um, I don't think it doesn't look like they're just fucking hanging around later on when that guy comes out and they question him about, you know, how was it? Was it worth the price? Yada, yada, yada. They aren't like bandit. They aren't out there shouting their wares or talking up these women to anybody. They are just standing around talking to one another. So they're barely even trying. And I don't know if it's because they feel like this is beneath them because it has to do with Asian women and and they feel like Sai has sort of pawned off a task to them that is insulting in a way, but. This this moment where they notice that Lee is better at all of this than them, it could go a couple ways, you know, it could motivate them, it could make them resent him even more, and they get rude or even violent with him, or they could figure out a way, and this is based on the behavior of white men throughout history, what's most likely is that they figure out a way to take credit for Lee's work, and We'll see which one of these they choose. Um, I don't know why I'm getting so many calls the past couple of days, but I have this on Do Not Disturb and it rang anyway. 
Um, all right. So this is when Joni comes in and talks to Sai and tell she just doesn't even have to like explain to him what's going on. She's obviously in a really bad way. Like she's handling herself with uh, as much calm and what's the word level headedness as she can. But it's pretty clear that she's almost losing it. And we do see later that she has to medicate herself, basically. Like, I don't know if she shot up or if she smoked or what it was she did. But later on, she is fucked up because that is like the only way to get through this. And in this scene, she's just so distraught. Um, She tells him there's just me left. And he sort of like smirks. In this way that's really satisfied. I hate Sai so much. I just think he's glad. In a lot of ways. No matter who died. To see that Joni's effort. At going off by herself. Has failed the way that it has. Like. It's just a really selfish gross thing. And she's here to ask. Whether or not any of these women. Who were murdered. Are still needing to be buried. Because she would like to take care of that. And he tells her that there are no remains. Basically telling her that this has been taken care of and they are going to b- disappear. Um, and she says, as far as I know, these three were still alive when I went when I left. Um, but I sent away the others that I knew of that I could find so that they will never return and never be a problem. Um, and as I won't be either to you or Woolcott. And I ask after Maddie and Doris and the other outside girl, not making a problem, but if Woolcott killed them and there's remains to see him buried. Um, so yeah, she's like not totally sure that they're gone, but assumes that they are gone and gets confirmation here. Um, And the whole way that this goes down, this conversation is so, like, I just hate Sai so much. I know I say this every episode, but every episode, there is a new moment where he handles something in a way that I just find so despicable. And it's not even the way he handles it exactly. Handle implies... That there is a specific action that he takes in order to deal with the situation at hand. And I found it to be a bad decision or a a gross decision. And it's not even that that sort of quantifiable. Everything about why I hate him rests in his expressions, the tone of voice that he takes the inflection that he gives and the way that he has to camouflage everything like everything he says is cloaked in like one layer of threat, one layer of paternalistic faux concern, one layer of possessiveness, and then another layer of threat over that. And it's just so like, there is so much ugliness and so much toxicity in everything that he says that it it blows my mind, frankly. there's It's the combination of the writers and the way that they actually write his lines and for sure this actor who just manages to have this incredibly sinister and frankly skin crawly vibe to him um oh god i just hate this so much and he says and and you're there now by yourself shammy and he says it again with a sort of like mocking it's no picnic is it running pussy like he is just so satisfied with her failure here even though her failure is no fault of her own her failure is due to a horrible man who Sai is bound up with. Sai has decided to park himself firmly in the camp of a murderous piece of shit man. 
And because he is willing to associate with somebody like that, that's the only reason that he has the advantage over Joni. That and the fact that he's a man, obviously. So it's just so gross. This is something that women have to deal with so much of the time. And it's just men get really condescending with us when we try and overstep what they perceive as our boundary and where we belong in the world. And if we do not succeed when we attempt this overstep, they put it down to them being right and us as a whole half of the population not actually being capable versus looking at the fact that we are part of a society that wants us to fail and will do everything it can to ensure that we fail so that we do not overstep our bounds again and we do not encourage others to overstep our bounds either because societies benefit from those who are in power in a society, they benefit from those who are not in power, knowing their place and functioning without protest within the role that we were assigned by those who are in power. And it's like this smugness that he has is so fucking familiar to any woman who has tried to do something and been slapped down and The only thing that sort of like, and this is a very sort of, that sort of softened this for me was that when he says that and she gets up and walks out without saying anything to him, once her back is turned, his face changes a little bit and he starts to look genuinely concerned. So in in part, I think maybe this... What's the word I want? This satisfaction that he is projecting, this um, this smugness is partially a put on because I think that he thinks that is somehow more impressive to her or, or – and impressive, I don't mean it in a personal way. I mean that this will reinforce to her that he is the man with the power and she needs to know that, right? But he underestimates so much what it would mean to her, I think, if he actually seemed to give a shit, to really give a shit, beyond business, beyond his connection with Wolka, if he gave a shit about these women's lives. And in his mind, he cannot afford to care. And he cannot afford for her to see him care. But I think if he did that would really go a long way towards healing this rift between them, which I think genuinely bothers him. I think this rift is like, he just just doesn't understand what she wants. And he keeps thinking that being the guy with the power over her is going to like, in the end, be all it takes. And it's like, it doesn't have to be this way, dude. You could be a little bit more on even footing and, You'd still have the power and she knows that. But if you seem to have her like interests at heart in any way, that's not a weakness that she's going to like exploit. Joni's not an idiot. You know, she's not going to push things too far. (sighs) So anyway, this scene was just hard to watch. And Joni's acting here when she just gets up and leaves, just like my heart broke when she turns up high later. I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but Woolcut, we have like a brief scene with him where he's shaving. And this was another, this was a moment of me being like, what's going on here? And he puts the razor to his cheek like he's going to shave. And then he presses the razor to his own throat. And it's the first time in this show since meeting Woolcut that it even occurred to me he felt bad for what he's done and that's not to say that I have any sort of sympathy for him at all but I have to tell you guys that I just see him as this like sadistic murdering asshole who's kind of gleeful about it even though we don't see the glee he's not the kind of person to share his emotions in that manner 
But I assumed that inside, after killing these women, that there was a sort of um, satisfaction for him. And I'm realizing now that that might, might not actually be true. And, and not only might it not be true, but I could just be misunderstanding the way that this goes, because maybe for him, murdering is sort of an addiction and it ha it's followed by the same self-loathing as somebody who's a drug user who thinks that they've gotten past this and don't need to do this anymore. And then they use again and they're disgusted with themselves. So I'm actually really curious about how this like works in his head. Does he have self-loathing for wanting to do this and fighting it? Is this something that he really did because he felt it was simply necessary and it has nothing to do with this like constant low level desire to hurt women? Is there something else entirely going on? But this self-loathing that I'm seeing is, is completely unexpected. 1000% unexpected. And I was really startled by the scene and I wasn't even sure about it. It wasn't until later that I was like, okay, I guess I was right when I read it that way. Um, and before we get to that, we'll go to Al, who uh, he is in his rooms sort of exercising his leg that's always uh, – it's, it's working a lot better than it had been. I mean, you know, the start of the episode, he walks over to see Merrick and he hadn't even been able to walk before. He was able to sort of like lean from one thing to another and hold himself up. But at this point, he's able to genuinely walk, although it's obvious there's something wrong when he does. He's got a pretty significant limp. Um, so E.B. gets summoned in and he tells E.B. to let the widow know that he wants to have a meeting with her. And E.B. is so fucking frustrating, guys. E.B. was left out is the name of this episode because of the fact that that Al purposely keeps E.B. out of this meeting because he knows that E.B. can't resist blackmailing somebody if he can get the chance. Because E.B. is a pathetic, greedy, spineless creature. And blackmail would be his favorite thing because it's so sort of passive aggressive. But at this point, E.B., just desperately wants to know why Al wants to meet with the widow and keeps pushing for Al to tell him why. And Al has to finally just like scream at him and be like, holy shit, dude. How about it's none of your fucking business? How about go and do what I said to you and don't ask questions and don't keep poking and prodding asking for details as if I don't know what you're doing. I'm not a fucking moron. And later on, when E.B. does present that uh, this request to the widow, he still can't resist asking her if she know like, what the reason is for the meeting, to which she just replies with, didn't he confide in you? With this look of just such satisfaction at the expression on his face when she realizes it's quite clear he has no idea. And E.B., Man, you are so fucking irritating. I appreciated how Al just screamed. Like, I don't feel like we've heard Al yell at anybody the way that we hear him yell at EB. In, like, throughout these episodes. It's pretty amazing. Um, So, we go back to Joni. I don't know exactly, because when we cut to Joni, she has taken off her hat. She, she has that amazing, like, gray velvet top hat with that huge black, like, um, buckle that's got all of the black rhinestones on it and the white scarf that falls down the back, which uh, it's so, like, over the top, but I still just love it. Um, but she doesn't have it on, so I feel like she stopped somewhere, and I don't know if it was at the Chamois or what, but she's rushing over here um, to see Charlie, and... She tells him, there's three gone. It was bad. I know it was bad. And he thinks she means the three that were in the wagon. And she's like, no, no, no. These three that I'm talking about are dead. My partner and two girls. And he says, of what? Because he thinks maybe there was like an illness. 
And she says, they must have been killed. And I think she came here for that because she would have shot him and not been scared. She was the only woman I have ever met that wasn't scared of any man. Um, my mama feared my daddy. I did. And my sisters too. I never met a girl till Maddie that wasn't afraid of men. And he says, and Maddie's dead now. And she says, yes. And Carrie, her girl, she brought and Doris, who sign made come with us to spy and the place empty of any sign that they was ever born or lived or got killed. And uh, he says it was Cy Tolliver who killed them. She says, no, it was a man named Woolcott killed them that works for George Hurst. He says, why? And she says, I don't know. I'm not a man. Girl, if that isn't the fucking truest sentence, do you know what? Like, because the way that she says that, this isn't a woman who thinks this had anything to do with politics or anything of that nature. It may had be cloaked in that for Cy. Like this is a guy who wants to keep his secret secret because of what he does for Hearst. And so that scene is like a matter of politics. But as far as Joni is concerned, this is just another man with another fucking power play. And I can't disagree at all. Um, and she, he says, I believe I know we'll cut to look at. And she says, it's a secret, Charlie. It's only between us. I told you as a friend. And he says, and that's how I heard it. And he keeps his word to her later. But he says, I'm your friend. And she begins to cry. And he very awkwardly, like, takes her into his arms. And it's a really sweet scene. Like, I feel like there's been a lot of effort made to have Charlie not come across as leering or creepy with Joni. Despite the fact that there is, there's no doubt an attraction there. I mean, she's an attractive woman and she's also got this sort of like confidence and desire to buck norms that I think he admires or else he probably wouldn't have been hanging out with Wild Bill. Um, but yeah, this moment of him embracing her is completely lacking any sort of like sexual tension or any, like, it's just genuinely a guy who's trying to comfort a woman and he's not familiar with this, you know, this action. He just doesn't really know how to do it because the only woman that he consistently spends time around is Jane. And Jane isn't exactly fucking vulnerable, you know, like, I mean, she is, we know she is, but she just tries so hard to keep people at arm's length. And this sort of moment with Jane would not go this way. Um, but Later on, there's this whole thing with her that I really thought was so good, but we'll talk about that. Um, so this winds up being followed up by this amazing scene in which Charlie Utter picks a fight with Wolka in line at the hotel because he knows who this guy is and is just wanting to kick the shit out of him for what he did. And he, can I tell you guys, the fear that I felt watching this, I really thought Wilka was going to murder Charlie. And I have no doubt if Wilka decided to fight back, he would win. And I watched in amazement as Charlie continues to insult him, get up in his face and I mean, get up in his face in the like the sense of the word that he has to stand on tiptoe to get up to his face because he's like a foot shorter. And then he grabs the guy and throws him outside and beats him. And I am waiting, waiting waiting, waiting for this dude to defend himself. He even mentions, Charlie mentions that Wolcott's got a, a knife on him. And this guy makes no effort whatsoever to defend himself. It's in a way 
so incredibly satisfying to watch because he's just such a piece of shit and you want somebody to fucking do something. It's also terrifying because I, as I said, am in no doubt whatsoever that he could kill Charlie pretty easily if he decided things had gone too far and he was done. And he never seems to quite get there. And then I also was startled at Charlie being this fucking like willing to take this risk. Charlie is that angry and that disgusted that he's going to take on a guy who is younger in better shape and taller and just, you know, generally probably more physically capable. And he's just going to go ahead and fucking pick a fight over nothing. And then he's not going to tell anybody why. He didn't tell a soul what happened. And that winds up sort of saving his life. But I got, I, like my estimation of Charlie Utter has just gone up so much from this episode. And I already loved Charlie. I already thought he was like one of the best people in the camp. I don't remember if I named him a cinnamon roll last episode, but he's obviously a cinnamon roll. Even if he did get in a fist fight and beat the shit out of a guy and break his ribs, he's still a cinnamon roll. And this moment, like having done everything that he has done throughout this season of just trying to look out for people in a general way and do his best. And even with like, you know, the Sue guy that, that, um, Seth wound up getting in a fight with like paying respects in terms of how to bury him and all of that moments like that. He just had such respect for me. And then this being willing to risk himself, he's not going into this aware of the self loathing that Francis Woolcott has for himself. He's not going into this knowing that Woolcott wants somebody to do something because he feels like he's trash He's doing this with no knowledge of what could happen, and he's doing it anyway. That is some bravery, man. That is just so – that's a lot. And the scene of him beating the shit out of Francis is so, like – it goes on so much longer than I expected. I kept expecting people to step in, and nobody did. Sai even watches from the sidelines and sees who he's – like, whose ass he's kicking and does not step in at all. Uh, so who steps in? Finally, Seth. He wants to know what the hell went on to cause Charlie to react this way. Charlie says personal fucking business. And then later on says it's because the guy stepped on my foot. Which, uh, I really want that to be what winds up getting spread around the camp. I want I want Charlie to have the reputation of getting so angry that somebody stepped on his foot that he would almost be them to death for it. Because if that sustains, that's going to give him a real nice like little aura of uh somebody not to fuck with and that could come in mighty useful. So, yeah. This whole scene Wow. It was just really unexpected. Really unexpected. I didn't know what he was going to do, but I never thought it would be something as as confrontational as just going up to the guy and beating the shit out of him. I thought he would find some other way to fuck with him. And I welcome this, you know? Definitely not used to this. Um, So EB comes in to talk to Al right after this. And Al wants to know if he has any idea what happened with the fight. And EB doesn't even know that a fight took place. Um, And then when he's like, says something about, oh, well, I think maybe he stepped on his foot. um, Al realizes that this guy is not going to be any use to him. And uh, he starts sort of brainstorming out loud. Utter took some cart out last night and he did so like with the supervision of Cy Tolliver's whore. And I feel like that must have something to do with this whole thing. And this results in Cy coming by to talk to Al 
and tell Al that he thinks this uh, handling of Wolka is a bad idea because of who Wolka represents and that they need to have a talk with everybody about how to handle the guy. I am going to jump ahead a little bit um, because I want to talk about that scene. In between, you know, we've got the scene of Seth talking to Charlie, demanding to know what happened. Charlie won't really tell him. We have the scene of Al going to visit the widow, which it's the first time that they have actually spoken to each other. Like, it's crazy to think that they have lived in camp together for as long as they have and that their interests have been so, like, at odds with one another from the start and yet they have never actually met but there it is. You know, he has had EB trying to buy her out. He never made an offer himself. And it was always supposed to be EB's interest, not his own. And as far as the murder of her husband, it was Dan that was out with her husband. And she never had like even met Dan either. I don't think. Um, I don't even know, to be honest. But so this scene with the widow is uh, essentially he has just come to tell her hey, so that woman that you hired works for the Pinkertons. And she's like, that doesn't seem right to me. And he's like, no, it wouldn't, because that's what they do. They infiltrate and they do what like they can, but they're not going to be obvious about who they are. And of course, they're going to pick somebody that you wouldn't sense for what they're trying to do, which is to undermine your reputation so that they can get you out of the way and get their hands on your gold. And once he's like explains to her what it is that Miss Isringhausen presented to him, she seems to believe him. She starts to come around and realize, okay, you know what? This feels like maybe this is exactly the sort of scheme that I've been expecting and uh, sort of probably low key like on the lookout for, but she just wouldn't expect it coming from a woman like Miss Isringhausen, which is understandable. And, Al essentially tells her that what he plans to do is to like take their 50 grand and get them to sign a contract stating what they plan to do and that they won't like come after him. And then he's going to hand that contract over to Alma to use as evidence when she comes at them for trying to smear her reputation. Now, I don't know why they would like sign anything. I feel like that's asking a lot more than they would ever do because I don't see them putting themselves out there this way. They have to know how duplicitous Al is. Like they've, I I mean, his reputation is such that they would have to know, right? So why would they give him a weapon like that with the signature and the whole way that this is like, I don't, I just don't really understand why he thinks, or if, or if he's trying to play her as well, um, which I don't think he is. I just didn't get that vibe. I think that he understands she is intelligent enough to know when she is being played. So she's not going to tolerate that. And I think that he also knows that she's not leaving camp anytime soon and she's got a ton of money and there's no possible way for him to like have an enemy like her in camp and be able to continue to get along the way that he is because she's about to try and like build a bank and shit like this is she's going to be somebody of real consequence and he doesn't like he can't risk that um but i'm going to read this because yeah um I just want to make sure that I have this. She's come to me and wants to give me money to confirm what she says you confessed, that you hired me to kill him. And uh, she asks how much they offered, and he says 50,000, which I'm not sure with her estate, like, or her gold claim now, how much that is in terms of, like, a percentage of what she is making, but I would assume, based on the size of the works on her claim that it must be pretty insignificant. Um, She says, and how much do you ask of me as commission to tell the truth? And he says, I don't like the Pinkertons. There's their muscle for the bosses as if the bosses ain't got enough edge. And she says, so you'd side with me on principle with this disdain. 
And he says, I will finish my fucking sentence first. Um, being, <coughs> excuse me, um, being the Hearst, um, combined with the Pinkertons, um, co- being the Hearst combi- combined in their fucking ilk, got their eyes on taking over here. Your staying suits my purpose. At which point she starts to get on him about swearing and it's the most fun. Like he's so automatic with the swearing that when she corrects him, he doesn't even know that he did it. Um, those are my prejudices and personal interests for siding with you. Um, and if you want to match their 50, I will leave that between you and your God. Um, but what uh the whole like way that this is handled i just don't think that he's trying to fuck with her he says i'd have them write out their offer and their terms and make them sign it i just don't see that they're gonna do that pinkerton himself that cucksucker i hate that bastard and she has to stop him again and he realizes he was swearing again the look on his face of puzzlement when she keeps on being like please and he's like what oh shit like I love it because I swear a lot, but I can turn it off. And uh, it's fun to see somebody who's genuinely like not used to ever having to worry about that. Um, I make him write out their offer with their terms and sign it. And I turn the document over to you to use as evidence against them if they ever came against you. And I guess I if she says, let me consider. I think that she's smart. I don't really know what other like play this could be except for him to just be like basically i want to establish that we're on the same side here um but anyway so i'm so far like into my recording guys and i'm still not even caught up i can't even believe how far let's talk about this meeting that i intended to jump ahead to but then had to stop and talk about alma because the first scene between alma and al is significant enough two al's Ooh, i didn't even realize that um that i didn't want to just like you know make short shrift of that. It deserves to be spoken of. Um, so let's talk about this, uh, meeting that they all have as a crew on the third <clears throat> Sai says on the thoroughfare this morning, an event transpired that should not be repeated. Times passed for acting like infants. Um, and he says, you know, I assume that he was provoked. And the thing is, the guy that he works for, the this dude cannot be treated the same way as everybody else. He needs special treatment. And everybody needs to be aware of how hard his boss can come down on us if he doesn't receive the special treatment that he feels entitled to. And this is when Al sort of tries to push it a little bit about knowing that there was like this wagon that took off from camp and that uh, uh, like Charlie Utter was involved with that. I'm not exactly sure if Cy had any idea Charlie was involved with helping Joni before this like moment. But I really am a little bummed that Al outed him in this way because I kind of want Joni to have a resource to go to that Cy doesn't know anything about and can't lean on. And now it's been sort of compromised. Um, But there's a certain expression on Cy's face at realizing that she had help from another man that it clearly like bothers him. Um. Sai, of course, pushes past that and says the background of the beating ain't the point, no more than the incident's particulars or how offensive, if I knew them, I might find the details personally. The Hearst interest requires special treatment, and we can face up to that like men or get steamrolled by the fucking alternative. And Seth says, which is what? And he says, which is getting them getting pissed off. They ain't getting treated special replacing us that don't with those who fucking will. Um, so this whole thing is basically 
Cy confessing to everybody that he is working with Hearst. He comes in here thinking that he's going to be able to convince them that they need to treat Woolcott differently than everybody else and get them all working together to sort of help Woolcott and thus, I think, get some more accolades or some more respect from Woolcott's boss because he got the whole camp to fall in line. But what he really winds up doing is just sort of confirming to everybody here that he is already George Hurst's bitch. And I think he realizes partway through his sentence that he has done that, that he has like let them all know very clearly where he stands. And he tries to sort of defend it by being like, look, even if the guy fucking killed somebody, this dude isn't going to be get con- isn't going to get convicted. He's not getting arrested. They will figure out a way to pay off the judge. And if they can't, they'll pay off the jury or any witnesses. And if not, then they'll kill everybody who is a witness. And he really looks around at them all as he says this, like, I don't understand why you all are this worried about it. And Al just says, I mean, Cy, all he did was step on Utter's foot. And he realizes how completely wrongly he has handled this whole thing. And I just loved this whole scene. Like, Cy being uncomfortable and realizing that he stepped wrong and that basically every important person in the camp knows that he is on this asshole side and put in through in his lot with whoever's trying to take this place over. That is a good moment for me. That was some satisfaction I got out of that. Like I just need side to fuck up. I need him to be like at a disadvantage. I just need it. I need it. I need it. Um, so, I hardly have any time left, so I'm going to wrap this pretty quickly. And my apologies that I took so long talking about all these these other plot points. But I just want to talk about how when Doc Cochran is treating Wolcott, Wolcott asks him to tell Utter that he has Bill Hickok's last letter. And he winds up going to uh, talk to him. And... It's a really like, it's a great scene because even as much as Bill is in this position, or Bill, Charlie is in this position of being, you know, he, he, he knows that this guy is some, with somebody powerful, like he's aware and he knows like what trouble he could be in if he pushes this any further, but he still screams at the guy and will not tell him about Joni or that she told him anything. He is so defensive of her and so unwilling to break his word. And it winds up working to his advantage because it's clear Francis was fishing to see if Charlie was going to go around fucking talking. But also, it's just so good for Joni to have somebody on his side who is not going to compromise her the instant that he like needs to. It's just and, – and the way that Francis – deals with with charlie is sort of respectful like francis seems to appreciate that charlie dealt out a beating to him i feel like there's a part of him that respects that charlie is a better person than he is just flat out you know um and i can't help but wonder what that's going to look like later on if that will turn into anything But in the end, Charlie takes the letter and seems really touched at the fact that he has something else of Bill's. And there's a momentary sort of peace between them where he asks, should I leave the door open or closed? And it's very clear in saying that, that he is extending a tiny little olive branch and Francis seems to appreciate that also. And I don't really know what to make of this because I want Charlie Utter to hate Francis. 
But there being a, an uneasy piece between them also feels sort of necessary, and I don't want to waste that either. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. And then we have the scene with Charlie and Jane. And Jane is, like, in such a bad way. She doesn't know what day it is. She turns up and she's got, like, chapped lips, like she's super dehydrated or got cut up or um and she woke up in the graveyard covered in bruises and he wants to know who beat her up and she doesn't even fucking remember. She has no idea what's going on. And he sa- she says, it's getting the better of me, Charlie. And she- I'm pretty sure she just means the alcoholism. Like, you know, just the fact that she's in this way. And Charlie knows that she's not going to change her ways. But he's going to take care of her as well he can. So he tells her to go inside and clean off. And she seems genuinely thankful for that. She doesn't give him as hard a time as she had. And I'm so glad to see them sort of being on the same side because she needs him. She really does. So uh, this is a really good episode, you guys. Really good. Like it was a little calmer than a lot of them have been in many ways. But, uh, you know, that fight with fucking... With Charlie beating the shit out of Francis was more than enough. Um, all right. So I'm sure that I've missed something. I'm sorry I took so long. Oh, there's the scene where uh, Al tries to get something out of Charlie and he can't. And that's pretty fun. But I have to leave it because I have another recording right away. So forgive me all. And um, I just really enjoyed this. And thank you, Patrick. And I will be seeing you all soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcast.